John chapter 13, John chapter 13, and I'm going to read from verse 34. John chapter 13, verse 34. New International Version, verse 34. A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have love, so if you love one another. May the Lord bless the reading of the scripture and its significance to the sermon as well. Thank you. Going to take you on a little study tour. Um, You will find more detail about this, and perhaps some of the detail that's not here in the Focus magazine, right? In the Focus magazine, which is being handed out today, which is entitled Reframing Life. It's about ways in which we can look at life and get more from it. Things that we can do that will bring more meaning and happiness and joy to our lives. You might like to have some for the folks at the um, um, meetings. Yeah. So what I'd like to tell you about is a very, is a unique research project, uh, the Harvard Study of Adult Development. Now, why would I bother to tell you about something like that? What would be its relevance? I hope you'll see the relevance as we go into it. It's also called the Grant Study because the man who was the benefactor initially for the study was a man by the name of Grant. He was one of these captains of industry who felt that he would like to make a contribution to the research that was being done at Harvard University, and he funded this study for a decade. Now, what's unique about this study is that it's been running since 1937. That's a long time. 1937. What else is interesting is that besides being running for more than 75 years, it had 268 male participants. And these participants were second-year students from Harvard University. So these men were intelligent, bright fellows. You don't get to Harvard unless you've done very, very well before that. And you're capable of maintaining the kind of rigorous study that's expected of you. So these were second-year students. Okay. And let me tell you a little bit about what happened. Right from the beginning, they subjected themselves to a very, very demanding um, series of tests, evaluations, questionnaires, They were to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth about their lives and the intimate details of their lives. One condition was that it would be only available to those who were the leaders, the people who were in charge of the study. And they were also not supposed to tell other people that they were participants in the study, okay? Which has largely been the case, except for One or two, which I'll tell you about. So through their student years, into their active duty in World War II, through marriages and divorces, professional advancement and collapse, and now well into retirement, the men have submitted to regular medical exams, taken psychological tests, returned questionnaires, and sat for interviews. So these fellows have been watched and evaluated, and what they've said has been recorded, and there is a huge data bank of information about these 268 men. Now, among them was one best-selling novelist, one Washington Post editor, four who ran for the U.S. Senate, one who served in the cabinet, 
In other words, they became that, right? Remember, they were just second-year students when the study began. And one US president. Want to guess? Nope. This man, when he became president, had the FBI come along and take his files, seal them in a box, take them away. And they will only be open in two, 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 uh, 2040. All right? And perhaps you'll realize why. John F. Kennedy. Now, if ever there was a colorful president, it was John F. Kennedy. If ever there was a man with a past, when he came to the presidency, um, it was John F. Kennedy. So this gives you some idea of the caliber of person that was involved in this study, right? Now, why is it so important, this research? Well, I'm going to try and give you some idea. It is the longest and the most exhaustive, what they call longitudinal study in human history. More than 75 years of evaluation. You know that the average study doesn't take anywhere near that length of time. A longitudinal study is an observational research method in which data is gathered for the same subjects repeatedly over a period of time. And this period tops everything that has ever been done. Right. In normal studies, we have what we call comparisons, right? They will compare the sugar eaters with the non-sugar eaters. Okay? They'll compare somebody who receives a new drug with another group who are receiving what they call placebos. In other words, something that makes no difference whatsoever to your health either way. So most studies are based on comparisons between the haves, those that have whatever the product is that they're trying to evaluate, and those that have not got that product. But this is different, because here you're looking at a group of people, and you're examining each one of them over the period, essentially, of their adult lifespan. And that's why it was called the Adult Development Study. Because looking at people as they mature and grow and develop, okay? Some of those people, very few of them are still alive. Most of them are deep into retirement or dead. The study goes on. Now, during the course of the study, remember, 75 years, those in charge have come and gone. So no longer do we have the same people who were there at the very beginning when the study was initiated. The sponsors of the study have come and gone. But the study continues. And at the present time, the present time, the person who's in charge of the study is himself in the vicinity of 80, in his early 80s. But he is a brilliant researcher. He is a leading writer. Um, he is a, an international speaker and a very, very interesting character. So why am I discussing with this, this with you today? Because of the conclusions that the study has produced. Some very interesting conclusions. People often say, that poor man, his wife left him and he's taken to drink. You've heard that before? Women, you get the blame, don't you? Right? Do you know what Professor George Valent says after studying? Now, he's the man I've just spoken about. After studying these people, after reviewing their lives, after looking at that data, he says... Actually, when you look closely, you see from the patterns of these men's lives that he's begun to drink, 
and that has helped to drive his wife away. He's put that illusion to bed. He stood that on its head. This is an interesting study because it is getting to grips with the realities of what's been happening in these lives. And over so long a period that people are able to put together interesting patterns. And, for instance, don't ever say she drove me to drink. Because you probably drove her there. Or her away. Okay, Let's take something else. One of the things that this study has really, really focused on is this. The power of relationships. And if anything, this is the, this is the kernel of what has emerged through the study through these 70 odd years. It is social aptitude. What is aptitude? Ability, right? So what would social aptitude be? The ability to get on with people, isn't that right? To interface with people, to act with people in a way which is acceptable, right? So it is social aptitude, he writes. Not intellectual brilliance or parental social class that leads to successful aging. If you're young, listen. If you're already there, listen. Okay? Here is something which is a fundamental truth. It is not social class. It is not intellectual brilliance and capability. It is social aptitude that really makes the difference. Okay? Now we're going to go on. Warm connections are necessary. And if not found in a mother or father, they can come from siblings, uncles, friends, mentors. What this is saying is this, that the relationships that we have as children, as young adults, and right through life are shaping and forming and it is when we have these close relationships, these warm connections, that our humanity is able to flourish as it should. You might be born with a silver spoon or a golden spoon. You might be born on the right side of the tracks. You might have an Einstein intellect. But you know what? If you don't have that ability to build relationships you're going to find happiness an elusive thing. Let's take it further. Good. Now, this, is, this, is, this has been proved by the study of these men's lives. Right? Good sibling relationships. Who are your siblings? Brothers and sisters. Good sibling relationships seems, seem especially powerful. 93% of the men who were thriving at age 65 had been close to a brother or sister when younger. Isn't that interesting? You guys there that have brothers and sisters in the home and get miffed with them, be careful. They could be more valuable to you and your happiness than you realize. You need to treasure and build those relationships. And as parents, we need to make sure we do all we can to enable them to build those relationships. And as we get to 65, well, well, I'm a year away from that. And I'm so grateful for the fact that I have some good relationships. You were talking about your sister having a birthday. When? Tomorrow. How old is she? 54. So she's older than you or younger than you. Older than you. Do you have a good relationship with her? That's fantastic. That is fantastic. What did I do there? I lent on it. It's back. Look at that. 93% of the men who were thriving, okay, who were happy, who had fulfilled lives, who had meaningful relationships, at age 65 had had them for years. Okay. Now, Valiant was asked, 
And this is the crunch. What have you learned from the grant study, men? His response? That the only thing that really matters in life are your relationships to other people. Now that may seem like a bold statement. That may seem like a very exclusive statement to make. But you know what? As a pastor who's had less experience than Pastor West, but nigh on 43 years of pastoral ministry, and you know you know, because you remember when I was wet. You got it. You got it. You know I was wet behind the ears when you met me for the first time. You were too, though, I think. We were kind of wet together, weren't we? Yes. <laughs> you know what I found? You know what I found? I found that the really happy people in the church are those who have looked after their relationships. Those who are approaching their sunset years, their golden years, with happy relationships. I had a, a family in, in one of my churches who were very wealthy. They were very wealthy. He owned a number of large blocks of flats. He owned large property uh, interests. He had a building business. He was set for life. Well off. You know what? The sad thing was that almost, you could almost write it on your calendar every six months as a pastor you'd have to pay a visit. And you'd have to sit between two people who were at war with each other. You know the feeling? It was sometimes sparked by the children. It was sometimes sparked by one of the two spouses. It was sometimes sparked by someone else in the church. But there would be, on a cyclical basis, some type of of Vesuvian eruption and I would be called and I would have to try and find a way through all of this to the point where there could be reconciliation some tears a hug and hopefully they were back on track again I recently a year or so ago Bumped into the, the woman. He's dead. Bumped into the woman. And you know what? It was at the church door. And the very first thing she said to me was something negative about him. He was dead. He was buried. He wasn't wandering around anywhere. But she had, in front of the person behind, and in earshot of the person who just shaken my hand to tell me about the pittance that he'd left her. Maybe it was Montezuma's revenge, I don't know. But a million or two is not a pittance, but she wasn't happy with that. And, you know, I come back to what he said. What did the grant men teach him? The intimate study of those lives, what did it teach him? It taught him that the only thing that really matters in life are your relationships to other people. You do not want to go through the full cycle of life and come to the end and find that those relationships are fragile. You may have experienced disappointment, you may have had betrayal. You may have had all sorts of things happen. But you want to be able to bring those things back, don't you? To where? To where you have a sound relationship with somebody. And a sound relationship within your church. 
with your fellow men in the church, at work. The unhappiest place to be is where you have a good salary, a challenging job, and a mucky working environment when it comes to the people that are there. Isn't that right? And I know of people who will give up the salary just to get the happiness, to get out of that situation. Well, let's, let's move um, on to have a quick look at Jesus and his relationships. Did he value relationships? Can you think of any relationships that he valued? Hey, what was that? Lazarus. We're going to come to Lazarus. But can you mention Lazarus on his own? Mary and Martha. Who else? Mary Magdalene. Well, we like to think that Mary Magdalene is the Mary of the Lazarus experience, but there are some who don't, you know, some who doubt that. Anyone else? His disciples. Absolutely. Let's, let's have a quick look through. What about his mother? Angela, what, what, what do we find in that relationship with his mother? Absolutely, his mother. And what kind of a relationship did they have? His mother comes to him at that marriage festival. And what does she do? She drops him in it. Doesn't she? All the wine has finished. All the grape juice has drunk up. And we don't, there's nothing. It wasn't her, it wasn't her she didn't organize it, but she thought she had, the, she had the relationship with him to go to him and say, son, do something about it. Isn't that right, Sven? Do something about it. And what does he do? Despite the embarrassing situation, which he now is in, right, he does something, doesn't he? And he produces the very first of his many miracles. That's right. And as you say, the, perhaps one of the most tender moments in the Bible is what he says to John and to his mother. There is your son. There is your mother. Jesus prized relationships. It doesn't stop there, though. He had an intimate, close relationship with his disciples. Right? There was even this situation where John could say that he was writing as the disciple whom... Jesus loved. I reckon Jesus loved them all. But you know, sometimes it's easier to understand. Even though we love, some are easier to understand. Isn't that right? That intimate relationship with them, it was a very special relationship. And that relationship eventually led to this Christian church's establishment and it spread vigorously around the then the world of that time. That relationship with Lazarus and his family, you're absolutely right. It was a unique, special relationship. And you know what? Of all the people, we can't even look at Mary and we think she's the one who had the special relationship with Jesus. She was sitting at his feet. But who's the one who had the Close relationship, close enough to come and say to Jesus, if you had have been here, my brother would not have perished. She actually leaves and she goes out and she meets him and she takes him on. Not disrespectfully, but she speaks to him with an intimacy that you don't actually find so much in the rest of the New Testament. Why did you not come on time? And he says to her, your brother will live. What does she say? Yes, I know he's going to live again. At the last day. I believe the Bible. I understand the Bible. You've taught me that. And then Jesus says, do you believe? And what does she say? I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God. Now we hear that coming from Peter. It gets squeezed out of him, doesn't it? But here, this woman has this... She has a very special relationship with Jesus. The three of them do. 
But it doesn't stop there. We go on and we find Jesus treasures his relationships with Peter, James, and John. They were obviously the leaders of the group. Where does he take them? Mount of Transfiguration. And you know, Peter thinks that his relationship is so good that what does he propose? He interferes. I mean, if you, if you and I were there and Moses and Elijah were present, what would you say? Andrew, would you raise your finger and say anything? Wouldn't you just hover in the background and listen? Peter does what? He puts his foot in it. He says, listen, Lord, can we not build some booths up here? Let's build some temporary accommodation so we can extend this experience. He's taking charge of this because he was close to Jesus. He felt he could speak to his master in that way. Who are the two guys that come to speak to Jesus about Future appointments. Pastor David, do you, have you ever been to a president and said, you know what, or a, or a person who's tipped to be a president and said to him, listen, when you come into your kingdom, when the session appoints you, would you mind remembering myself and my friend, and one of us can be the treasurer and the other one can be the secretary treasurer, or the, sorry, the executive secretary and the treasurer, I know you've never done it. Never. But these two guys felt that they, they, they had that close relationship with him. It's interesting, isn't it? Jesus and relationships. His relationship with his father. Something unique, something special. I and my father are one. If you've seen me, you've seen the father very special relationship. The last comments that he makes on this earth are directed to his heavenly father. Into your hands I commend my spirit. I've done all you've asked me to do. It's only darkness that I see ahead. And yet I trust you so much that I'm leaving my life in your hands. I am God and yet I, as God, give my all to you. I am subservient to you. What a relationship. Then we need to look at Jesus and our relationships, and I'm nearly finished. John 13, we read, 34 to 35, a new commandment I give you. It's not a new one, by the way. It's a renewed one. I give to you that you love one another just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. And if we were to, let me finish it. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love one for the other. Now, if we think about it, if we think about it, Professor George Valiant is saying, of all things, of all things, what is the most important? relationships. What is Jesus saying? Anything different? No, not at all. I just feel that this study is so important because you know what it does? It actually, it actually supports scripture. It supports Christ's comments. It supports Christ's life. It tells from a study which is the longest ever undertaken that the Bible is right. Jesus is right. I think I'm at the end of that. Which really should be the end of any good sermon. If a pastor's run out of time on his um or run out of out of his his slides, he should be finished, isn't that right? Let me close with this. In two thousand and nine, um a retired person living in Cheltenham on modest means, a man went up into his attic and found an old chest. He opened the chest, 
And he said to himself, mm, there's a lot of stuff in here that I haven't looked at for 50 years. Perhaps there's something I can sell. I suppose we all don't want to, none of us want to leave the legacy of, of, of stuff to our parents. And we don't want our kids trooping through our past. Let's, let's get, get it sorted out ahead of time, you know. So he took the stuff downstairs and he took the things out and he found some porcelain that looked valuable. He also found a painting, an oil painting. And he laid the things out on the 